Well, uh, welcome everyone to this live knowledge session with Argumentative Indians, themed as Atal Bihari Bajpayee, Progressive Stalwart or Closet Ideologue. I'm Debangana, Assistant Professor at Jain Dean to the University, Bangalore. And it is my pleasure today to be in conversation with Sagrika Ghosh, who needs little to no introduction, an eminent journalist with a career spanning over three decades and association with almost all the reputed Indian media houses, a columnist, a broadcast anchor, and of course, an author with multiple novels and non-fictions to her credit. The latest of our non-fiction books being Atal Bihari Vajpayee. You can see the uh, snippet of it at the background. And Atal Bihari Bajpayee, one of India's most fascinating prime ministers. Indeed, controversial a character, yet invoking curiosities for his unique leadership style, Hindutva ideological inclination, and prolific personality. Without further ado, it is time to turn to Sagrika to unfold the personality further and see him in the light of contemporary political occurrences. Sagrika, thank you so much for joining us today. Firstly, many, many congratulations on the book, Atal Vihari Bajpayee. And let me uh, take this forward from there. Uh, you have mentioned that the book uh, is based on extensive interviews with close Vajpayee A. Now, may I ask you what prompted you to undertake this project and that too at this time? So to be more specific, why Vajpayee and why now? Thanks, Devangana, and thank you very much to the Argumentative Indians for inviting me to your platform. I'm delighted to be here. Yes, this is my second biography of a prime minister. That's Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Uh, my first was Indira Gandhi, uh, and there's a third coming out as well, uh, but I can't tell you who it is uh, at the moment. Uh, but uh, the idea was to, uh, the idea between me and my publisher uh, is to uh, produce these, uh, a trilogy of uh, prime ministers, former prime ministers, um, and uh, bring them alive for a new generation. So the first was Indira, the second is Vajpayee and the third coming. And I think the reason why we chose Vajpayee is because uh, he was the first uh, BJP prime minister. Uh, he was the first uh, prime minister to lead a non-Congress government for a full five-year term. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that uh, there would be no Prime Minister Narendra Modi if there had not been an Atal Bihari Vajpayee to pave the way. Uh, so I think Vajpayee very much mainstreamed the BJP. He was the founder of the BJP uh, in 1980. And um, he created, uh, you know, the modern BJP. He and Mr. L.K. Advani founded the modern BJP out of what was earlier the Janasam. Uh, and I think the, you know, a number of the debates that we have at the moment on secularism, nationalism, uh, pseudo-secularism, remember Vajpayee was the one who coined the term pseudo-secularism in 1969, um, uh, all began actually with Vajpayee and Advani. That was the two-man alliance uh, that built the modern uh, Hindu nationalist movement uh, within politics. And um, I think that the great contribution of uh, Vajpayee Devangana is that he located uh, Hindu nationalism and uh, you know, Hindu uh, right-wing thought within parliament, uh, within the ambit of uh, parliamentary democracy. You know, Mr. Vajpayee was a right-winger, but he was not a right-wing nutcase. He was, you know, he was a parliamentary uh, Democrat, uh, and a constitutionalist who located um, Hindu nationalist right-wing politics within parliament and within uh, parliamentary democracy. Uh, you know, remember Mr. Vajpayee was in parliament, not for 10 years, not for 20 years, not for 30 years, not for 40 years, but for 50 years. 50 years he was a parliamentarian 
and he was a parliamentarian in times when the Congress was super dominant. You know, this was the Nehru-led Congress and the Indira-led Congress, and the Nehru-led Congress never won below 300 seats. Uh, the Indira-led Congress was a juggernaut, and he was leading the small Janasang uh, party against this Leviathan Congress. So working as an opposition politician in parliament uh, was uh, Vajpayee's identity. You know, he, he was the quintessential parliamentarian, the opposition parliamentarian in parliament. So uh, when we look at uh, the, the politics of Hindu nationalism and, and, and the politics of Hindutva, we have to look at the father of that, of the, of the crea uh, you know, of that, that uh, politics. And the father of modern uh, Hindu nationalist politics uh, is Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Uh, well, as you were mentioning uh, the, the Hindu nationalism in particular, but there is a disconnect and the disconnect comes with the fact that, um, you know, RSS with its ultra conservative morals, I would say, uh, it kind of, it looks or it appears to be in contradiction with Vajpayee's unconventional uh, personal life and takes in in various fronts. And as you are mentioning, that it was Hindu nationalism, right wing, but uh, at the level of parliament. So how do you see RSS grappling with this? That's a very good question, Devangana. And it's the tightrope that Vajpayee walked all his life. Uh, you know, Vajpayee joined uh, the RSS when he was a boy. He was, a, uh, he was in boyhood that he joined the RSS. RSS. He was caught up in the tumult of the independence era. I remember Vajpayee was uh, a teenager when India became independent. He was caught up in the uh, Gandhian move, you know, the Gandhian tumult was happening at the time. There was, you know, the Muslim League, the, the, the Indian National Congress, the Hindu Mahasabha. It was a time of great ferment. And that these were the turbulent years that Vajpayee grew to boyhood, uh, to manhood. And he um, joined the RSS against his father's wishes. His family was not an RSS family. His father was Pandit Krishna Bihari Vajpayee, who was an inspector of schools in the Gwalior state. And the Gwalior state, as you know, was loyal to the British Raj. And Krishna Bihari Vajpayee was very establishmentarian and he wanted Vajpayee to become either a civil servant or a, a lawyer. I mean, it was he was very disapproving of Vajpayee's um, choice to go into politics and to go into activism. Uh, and, and I think this was a lifelong disappointment that Vajpayee was always conscious of, uh, that he had disappointed his father in this way, because he was his father's favorite son. And Krishna Bihari would often say, my son Atalla will shine like a star. But he went into the RSS and he never broke with the RSS. He was always, as he said, a loyal Swayam Seva. In fact, you know, when people called Vajpayee a good man in the bad party, uh, he was always saying, no, uh, you can't uh, judge uh, you can't say you like a fruit if you don't like the tree. And he always said, I am proud to be a Swayam Sevak. And Vajpayee was a Hindu nationalist. I wouldn't call Vajpayee uh, a liberal. I think he was, a, he, was a, he was a Hindu nationalist who believed that the Hindu uh, was the, uh, you know, the, 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 the primary repository of Indianness and of Desh Bhakti and of uh, uh, Indian nationalism. And Hindutva was Bharatiyata, as he often said. So, I, I, but in government, Vajpayee was a liberal statesman. You know that that's the title of walk, the walk that he he made. And and he, I think Vajpayee's life makes it possible for us to understand that you can be ideological but still listen to other people. You can be rooted in a school of thought but still uphold plurality. You know, today we are so divided. Our lives are so polarized. We are either on this side or that side, or either secular or you're nationalist or you're, you know, bhakt or you're kam bhakt. You know, you're, you're sort of on these, these two camps uh, that are there. Our lives are so polarized. You know, the opposition is derided as the Khan market gang or urban naksal or tukri tukri gang or whatever. So we're divided into these camps. But in the 50s and 60s, uh, these, th th this kind of division, this kind of polarity was not so stark. And Vajpayee, you know, he was rooted in the, uh, so, uh, in the RSS and he was a Hindu nationalist. One of his closest friends was Hirendranath Mukherjee. 
Secretary of the CPI, um, Bhupesh Gupta of the CPI. Uh, he had a great admiration for Ranath Babu Pai, who was a socialist. Uh, he had a tremendous uh, he had a tremendous admir admiration for Jawaharlal Nehru. So uh, you know there was a time when you could have uh, friendship, you could have empathy, you could have sympathy, you could even have love, but you didn't have agreement. Uh, it, it was possible to disagree within the parliamentary framework, but still be, uh, you know, still be friends, still be, uh, still be cooperating, and still try to build consensus. And I think that's the lesson of Vajpayee. You know that that you you can believe in an ideology, but at the same time uh, you can also reach out for consensus. And Vajpayee reached out cons constantly for consensus. But as you rightly say, this was a tightrope walk. You know, when in government, for example, the tenure from 1999 to 2004, Vajpayee was relentlessly attacked by more orthodox members of the Sangh Parivar, uh, whether it was the Swadeshi Jagran Manch, whether it was the Vishwa Hindu Parishad, whether it was orthodox sections of the RSS led by K.S. Sudarshan. Uh, Vajpayee was constantly targeted because his government was a very liberalizing, privatizing, globalizing government uh, with, you know, Ram Mandir on the back burner, with uh, reach out to Pakistan, reach out to Muslims, you know, taking a centrist line because Vajpayee had so many allies that he had to keep happy. And he was, you know, Yashwan Sinha, uh, who was the uh, uh, finance minister and then the foreign minister in Vajpayee's time, told me that the RSS were literally at our throats uh, every day. But, and Vajpayee had to walk a tightrope uh, in balancing uh, his government's priorities and uh, the demands of the Sangh. And I would say in government, Vajpayee was not an RSS man. He, he was an RSS man in his conviction and his ideology, but in government, he was not. Because in government, he always said, I'm an elected representative. I am elected by the people of India and I'm responsible to parliament. You see, because he took parliament so seriously, because he was born and raised in parliament, uh, he took parliament extremely seriously and you know his bureaucrats would uh, some of his former bureaucrats who i spoke to in the course of this book told me that you know a pradhan mantri ko sansad mein baitha rehta hai because he was always in parliament and this is a big contrast from mr narendra modi who has never been a parliamentarian i mean he entered parliament in 2014 uh, he entered only 2014 he entered modi entered politics through um through state power, through the office of chief minister. He became chief minister of Gujarat and then went on to win elections and then became prime minister. Vajpayee was never a state level politician. He was always a parliamentarian and worked in parliament. And he never had access to the instruments of state power. Uh, you know, Vajpayee never had, he never had state power. He, he became prime minister at the very end of his life at the age of uh, 75. So uh, he was he was always without state power. He was always in parliament, and so he respected parliament too much to uh, ever do anything without consensus. And so I think this is it was a tension. You know, it was a tension, and uh, and I don't think the RSS was very happy with Vajpayee. It was not they were not very happy with his prime ministership, and. Um, when Vajpayee was defeated in 2004, uh, you know, then it became clear to the Sangh Parivar and, and, and everybody in the Sangh Parivar said, this is, this is because he strayed from our Vichardhara. Who Vichardhara ko nakardiya, so that's why we have lost. Um, you know, Ram Madha, the RSS ideologue, said at the time that he lost, you know, because Vajpayee was seen as strained from the ideology. And you're absolutely right, he did this because he was an iconoclast and because of the kind of personal relationship he had, personal life that he had. You know, we can talk about personal life in the next question. Uh, you know, his personal life was deeply bohemian. It was deeply unconventional. He lived all his life with a married woman who he fell in love with when she was in college. They were, uh, they were you know, lovers in college. Uh, but he was then, in, you know, he became involved in activism and he went in the activist line. She got married and married uh, uh, a college professor. And then they lived together as a threesome. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a very unconventional menage a trois, which, uh, which he never tried to hide. And uh, he didn't flaunt it, but he never tried to hide it. And, um, you know, he, 
And I think this personal life, and you know, a lot of people have asked me that as a woman, how do you uh, approach biographies? Do you approach biographies differently from male biographers? And I think as a woman, I do. I think because I place a lot of uh, importance on personal relationships. And I think how a personal re re how a person reacts to his close uh, circle reveals to me much more about the person than simply his speeches or his uh, deliberations and party uh, matters. So I think, you know, if, if you're this unconventional, I mean, think about it. In those days, you're living with a married woman, her husband and her children, who you adopt as your own. Uh, now, this to me speaks of a highly uh, irreverent and iconoclastic person. And so he was irreverent about everything. He was irreverent about the shibboleths of secularism and socialism of the Nehru era. He was irreverent about RSS ideology. He was irreverent about even about Hinduism. You know, he kept saying, um, he said that, you know, Hindu, uh, the Hindu must not be uh, constrained by Sankirnata and Rudiva, you know, uh, narrow mindedness and, and rigidity. Uh, and uh, and I think that uh, so he was a, he was an iconoclast about about uh, very fundamental uh, issues and I think this iconoclasm and this irreverence um, shows in how he dealt with the RSS also you know the RSS was very unhappy about his personal relationship they didn't like the fact that their big star I mean their main politician was living in a menage a trois with a openly living in a menage a trois with a with a married woman. Uh, they were very, very disapproving of it, uh, but he did it, and uh, and I think that says a lot about Vajpayee. You know, that says a lot about Vajpayee. Uh, will it be right to say that uh, his understanding or his stream of Hindutva ideology is um, more towards Savarkars as compared to Golwalkars? Will it? Uh, would you make that kind of a uh, I think Vajpayee would be more, I think, you know, Vajpayee was much more towards, uh, say, uh, rather than Savarkar or Golwalkar, I think he would be Madan Mohan Malviya, Lala Rajpat Rai, Shama Prasad Mukherjee, uh, you know, uh, in the sense that I don't think Vajpayee's Hindutva was ever militant uh, or uh, supremacist. Uh, Vajpayee was rooted in politics. You know, the, uh, the big influence in his life was Shama Prasad Mukherjee. Because, you know, had it not been for Shama Prasad Mukherjee, uh, Vajpayee would not have been in politics. Because Shama Prasad Mukherjee, when he set up the Janasang in 1951, uh, as you know, he approached uh, Golwalkar, who was then the Sarsang Chalak of the RSS, because he needed a volunteer force. And Shama mm -hmm. Prasad Mukherjee, you know, he is a very interesting character. He um was highly educated he was brilliant he was in nehru's cabinet he is a barrister bar at law returned from from england uh he was the young one of the youngest the youngest uh, chancellor of calcutta university after his father so ashutosh uh mukaji and uh, shama prasad mukaji was uh you know he was a he was no not a wild-eyed demagogue he was a uh, conservative politician he was rooted in politics. And that's what Vajpayee was. He was a conservative politician. He was a Hindu nationalist, but he was rooted in politics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he was rooted in fighting elections. And, and when uh, Shama Prasad Mukherjee set up the Janasang, uh, Golwalkar loaned a group of RSS men to uh, Shama Prasad Mukherjee to help him build the Janasang. And th this group was led by Deen Dayal Upadhyay. And one of the people who was in this group was Atal Bihari Vajpayee. And from the beginning, Vajpayee's oratory, you know, because he was a tremendous speaker and he was a tremendous public speaker. And uh, from the beginning, his oratory was noticed in the RSS. And uh, uh, Gurwalkar and Mukherjee and Dindayal Upadhyay became very keen to use Vajpayee for political roles because he was such a good speaker. So uh, he actually was, uh, uh, after Mukherjee died, uh, he contested the by-elections of 1955 in Lucknow and then, you know, was then put up from as many as three places in 1957. He was he contested from Balrampur, from Lucknow and Mathura. So they were so desperate to get him into parliament because he was such a, you know, he was such an asset to them. 
Uh, and so from the start, Vajpayee's in into politics was through, uh, in into, into public life was through politics, you know, through Shama Prasad Mukherjee. And Shama Prasad Mukherjee was motivated by the one aim of building a national alternative to the Congress. You know, his was not a cultural messianic vision of uh, transforming Hindu society or transforming in, uh, uh, Indian society into uh, Hindu, Hindu Rashtra or any of that. I mean, Shama Prasad Mukherjee was building a uh, alternative to the Congress. And so Vajpayee's role or his political identity was always to create the political identity, uh, political uh, alternative to the Congress. So he was a out and out political animal, you know, and in an, in an, in an, uh, in an article actually written after the Janata Party collapsed in 1977, Vajpayee wrote in the Indian Express that the RSS should concern itself with what it does with cultural activities and, you know, with, uh, with uh, it, it, you know, it's social building, social work and it's, you know, relief work and all of that. But it can't, it should not enter into politics because mm -hmm. I'm an ill, because we are political, we are elected. He used to keep saying this I'm an elected politician. I have been elected by the people. I'm elected, I have won votes, and I have won, and therefore I am accountable to parliament. I'm, and I'm accountable to people in parliament, all of whom who have been elected, right? Everyone who sits in parliament has been elected. Whether you right. whether they are of one ideology or another or another ideology, each one of those people has been elected by the citizens of India. Mm -hmm. So they are on equal footing. So this was his worldview that I'm an so the, the politics and government must be done by elected politicians, by people who are being voted in. And he always, you know, wanted the RSS to uh, stay out of politics. Right. Now, this uh, takes me to my next question, which is when you are saying that the, it's, it's, his idea was that he was rooted in politics and yeah. uh, elected by people. Uh, same goes for prime minister, uh, being a prime minister or prime ministership, uh, that it is often said that a PM is not a PM for a particular party or a particular ideology, but uh, the prime minister is for everyone. Yeah. Now, one of the biggest talking points of present day India uh, is the comparison between NDA 1 led by uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee and the current prime minister Modi led ruling dispensation. Now, of course, there is a changing style of political leadership. Uh, and both the government and both the leaders in this case being backed by Hindu ideology we can see that there has been a remarkable difference in characterization of the liberal democratic space. And this starts from a uh, policy framework and it goes to the party dynamic. What made the entire Indian political scenario uh, conducive to such drastic changes? Well, I think that, you know, uh, first let's point up uh, the differences, you know, uh, the difference, um, think about it, in Vajpayee's time, an NDA government uh, lost its majority by one vote. In 1999, Vajpayee fell in parliament by one vote. Can you imagine any BJP government today falling by one vote in parliament? I mean, it, it brought, the, the government collapsed, he had to resign. Uh, this is unthinkable today. You know, uh, Vajpayee had as his closest associates uh, someone like a George Fernandez, who was a, a former socialist, who was a sympathizer with the Myanmar students' uh, struggle, uh, who was, uh, he had, uh, he was deeply critical of the RSS. Such a figure would certainly be called an anti-national today, or he would certainly be called a, sort of a, uh, you know, a, a, he would certainly be regarded as beyond the pale. Vajpayee's closest associate was uh, Rajesh Mishra, who ran the RS, uh, who ran the PMO, uh, Jaswant Singh, who was his uh, uh, his uh, foreign minister. Now, neither Rajesh Mishra nor Jaswant Singh had links with the RSS. So, Vajpayee's government was a very different government in the sense that his uh, ministers were not 
uh, some many of his ministers were not directly linked with the RSS at all. Ar Arun Shuri, Yashwant yeah. Sinha, uh, Jaswant Singh, um, you know, uh, they were they were they were not linked with the RSS. Pramod Mahajan was linked with the RSS, but the RSS had a lot of disapproval from Pramod Mahajan because he was seen as flashy and um, you know and 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 linked with uh, you know with capitalists. So uh, uh, you know it was a very different NDA and. You know the other the other fact of, of Vajpayee is that he never uh, Vajpayee could never cross the two hundred seat jinx. He could he always the BJP always stopped at one hundred and eighty two in the leadership of Vajpayee. He could never go beyond two hundred. So he was always dependent on allies. And the question I'm always asked is, what if Vajpayee had got three hundred plus seats? Would he have been equally ideological and you know pushing on three seventy and pushing on through CAA? I don't think so because I think again Vajpayee was rooted in Parliament and it would, and it would have been beyond him to um, do anything out of consensus. That was just not him, you know. Pancho ki Rai uh, was was his was his credo. Now, what has changed between um, between Vajpayee's time and today? I think a number of factors. I think uh, the uh, core Hindutva. Uh, vote has vastly expanded. In Vajpayee's time, the core Hindutva vote was much smaller. Uh, I think the role of media, the role of social media, the role of, uh, you know, the crumbling opposition, Vajpayee had a much stronger opposition in his time. Um, and I think that, you know, the uh, manner in which uh, the personality cults of today are being promoted in media, uh, and and uh, you know and uh, by the ruling party, I don't think Vajpayee was ever that kind of a personality cult. Um, and uh, the reason why India has changed since uh, since uh, Vajpayee to now, it could be because of the you know ten years of the UPA, which led to disillusionment. It led to disillusionment about corruption. It led to disillusionment about leadership you had the anna hazare movement in 2011 which became a big sort of venting of uh, public um, anger against corruption public anger against uh, elite disconnected leaders and that led in a way to the rise of the uh, what we are seeing today is the modi phenomenon uh, but uh, the uh, rise of the kind of uh, uh, communal mobilization uh, of uh, of today was certainly not there in Vajpayee's time because Vajpayee did not do it. He, he was not a, com in, in that sense, not a communalist. And the government of Vajpayee tried very hard to walk the middle path because he genuinely believed, Vajpayee was a genuine economic reformer. You know, he was, a, he was, a, he was convinced about economic reform. He was convinced that the business of government was to get out of the economy and let the economy uh, proceed along uh, reformist privatized lines. He overhauled telecom, he overhauled, you know, the, he had a ministry for disinvestment. So Vajpayee's energies were elsewhere. The, the ruling regime uh, was not promoting uh, majoritarianism uh, to the extent that it is today. Uh, and probably that's why uh, the country was a very different place uh, in that sense. You know, in fact, after the Gujarat riots of 2002, Vajpayee, uh, you know, Vajpayee at that stage wanted to, as you know, uh, dismiss the Gujarat government and dismiss Chief Minister Narendra Modi of Gujarat. But then he was prevailed upon by his party uh, not to. And so he went along with his party, but he he did want to dismiss Modi. So I think that uh, I think Vajpayee himself was not a majoritarian. His regime did not promote majoritarianism. Uh, he was not an elected autocrat. He had very strong ministers. Today, we don't have the kind of strong ministers that Vajpayee had. Vajpayee had very strong, tough ministers who were very high profile, who were uh, given their head to uh, run their ministries the way they could. Uh, Vajpayee's close associates in government were not uh, RSS men. There was a certain kind of Vajpayee man that was there, the Vajpayee men who were liberal, who were liberal, believed in the liberal economy. They were pro-US, they were pro-privatization, they were anti-Congress, of course, but they believed very much in kind of classical right-wing uh, politics. And I think, uh, which was located in parliament. So I think Vajpayee's government uh, was not a, it was not a majoritarian, ideologically driven government. It couldn't be because he had, you know, he had to deal with, uh, with uh, 24 allies. 
but even uh, but but even so india was a different place and i think uh, subsequently you know the upa came into power and then there was massive kind of mobilization say with the anna hazare movement and i think the climate for communalism began to grow because it was promoted uh, effective you know very efficiently by uh, by state power i mean today we have the instruments of state which are actually uh being used for partisan uh, ends and to promote a partisan ideology this happened last in the case of indira gandhi when she used the instruments of state to promote her brand of ideology now we see that the instruments of state that is this, this the, the the state power is being used to promote another brand of ideology uh, vajpayee never used state power to promote ideology you know because he never had access to state power he was not a politician of state power modi is a politician who uses state power to play politics vajpayee never had access to any instruments of state power as i said until he was 75 uh but is it not uh, also that at this point of time we see that the cultural front of rss uh, mm -hmm. is also permeating into the uh, political front yeah. so we cannot just say that now all the stands that are taken politically they are purely political decisions no um, they're ideological right they're ideological because you know I, actually when i was writing the book and I, as you say when i was writing the book i used to think where is the swadeshi jagran manch today and where is the you know bharatiya mazdoor sang and where is the vishwa hindu parishad because in vajpayee's time they were out on the street every day you know uh, the bharatiya mazdoor sang was calling yashwant sinha an apradhi uh the vishwa hindu parishad was calling vajpayee half congressman ye to congressi hai uh, they were calling vajpayee all kinds of names the organizer which is the mouthpiece of the uh, rss wrote an article saying the vajpayee government should be consigned to the dustbin of history so they were attacking vajpayee all the time and i was thinking to myself where are these where are these groups today why are they why are they not why, why don't we see them today and the reason we don't see them is i think that because they are uh, they are uh, they are stakeholders in the government because you know remember mr modi is not he hasn't come into politics through through politics he's he's an rss ideologue he was an rss exactly. prachara hmm. modi narendra modi is an rss prachara who was loaned to the who has come into politics through the rss vajpayee began life with shama prasad mukherji and contesting elections and through parliament so it's a very different route into politics now you were just talking about um, his composition in and the cabinet in the cabinet and um, his reliance on expertise more than ideological nepotism if i can say so uh, now does this um, preference of for merit uh, over loyalty does that partly explain why uh, you know during that time uh, we had like a, a substantial economic growth as compared to now as well as uh, it exuded remarkable uh, political strength also at the uh, international front particularly we had the uh, you know second nuclear test happening right so uh, what would be your comment on that yes i think bajpayee's was a high performing government on the economy the economy at some point even leveraged a 10% growth rate uh, there was uh, you know 2003 uh, i don't know how old you were in 2003 but i was certainly very old uh, in 2003 was a boom year you know it was uh, uh, you know the middle class india was clicking its heels and shouting yippee you know um five star hotels golden quadrilateral uh, the economy was on an upswing of course it began in 1991 with the arrival of manmohan economics and and you know the liberalization of the economy but that was done under pressure i mean they were in a crisis situation they had to liberalize the economy vajpay liberalized the economy because he believed in it he strongly mm -hmm. believed in uh the uh, uh privatization and liberalization and globalization ideals and he believed in these and he pushed forward and there was a ministry of disinvestment and arun chori went for it hell for leather selling off you know all major government undertakings the telecom sector was overhauled um great strides were made in infrastructure uh there was a, you know road and rail connectivity Uh, so you know all of these these uh, the, on the economy vajpayee was a very high performing government he was not a very high performing government in 
national security. Because on national security, I believe Vajpayee faltered badly because the style mm -hmm. of Vajpayee was, you know, delegating, autonomy giving, giving ministers their autonomy, giving, letting ministers work. But such a government becomes easily becomes a kind of tower of Babel. You know, it becomes a sort of uh, chaotic mesh of voices where it's difficult to be coherent. And he was already decisive prime minister, and that's it. So you had uh, ICH-14, the hijacking of ICH-14, you had the Kargil War, you had Operation Parakram, which was which was a fiasco. Uh, you had the parliament, uh, you know, the 2001 attack on parliament. So uh, he was, uh, Vajpayee was, Vajpayee's government was not a very high performing government on national security, on economy, very high performing and very high performing on foreign policy. I would say on foreign policy, Vajpayee abroad was, you know, Nehru 2.0. I mean, he was, he was deeply respected, uh, you know, and what, what is amazing about Vajpayee is, you know, being the Hindu nationalist that he was, being the Janasanghi Jana that he was, his repeated attempts to make peace with Pakistan, he kept trying. You know, he went in a bus in 1999, he had the Agra summit in 2001, he had the Islamabad declaration in 2004, before that as a foreign minister, he kept trying to reach out to Pakistan. So reaching out to Pakistan was one of his, uh, you know, one of his, uh, one of his obsessions, I would say. And actually, uh, you know, I interviewed him uh, in, uh, in 1998, when I was doing a cover story for, uh, for uh, Outlook magazine on, I, it was called the Swadeshi Nehru. And this was a cover story I did on Vajpayee. And I interviewed him, I did a long interview with him at the time. And he said that, you know, and I said, what was the, the main thing you'd like to do? And I think that, and he said, good relations with Pakistan. You know, that, that's the main thing. And in 2004, he was interviewed in, by NDTV. And he again said, you know, he was, he was asked, which, what is the achievement of your regime? And he said, peace with Pakistan. So he kept trying to make peace with Pakistan. And as a result, he, had a lot, he got a lot of respect abroad. Uh, and he got a lot of respect internationally. And I think Bajpai at the same, you know, he reached out to the United States. He had the Pokhran II atomic uh, test, but at the same time reached out to the United States through the Just One Stroke Talbot talks. Uh, at the same time, he did not join, as you know, the Iraq War Coalition of the Willing. Uh, <clears throat> so he was able to uphold India's uh, enlightened self-interest. Uh, he was up, uh, able to uphold India's national security, and not compromise on those. But at the same time, he, um, you know, I think made a big break in Indian foreign, big break through in Indian foreign policy in the manner in which he reached out to the, to the United States. In many ways, Manmohan Singh was able to build on Vajpayee uh, to, re, you know, to reach out to George Bush and then create that into U.S. nuclear deal. So right. uh, on economy and foreign policy, I would say Vajpayee scores. On national right. security, he does not score. But, uh, you know, as compared to that, and you were talking about Pakistan, uh, now when I look at the current regime, I think there's a constant need to, you know, recreate the other out of Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, as, as much as it seems that that gives a validation of Pakistan being bad, you know, gives India always a validation of being good, this kind of a binary. Uh, it, this was, uh, I'm sure, was not prevalent uh, during Vajpayee and no, not how at did all. that change? How did that uh, discourse change? Well, as I said, you know, Vajpayee was a politician, Modi is an ideologue. I think these, that, that's, that's, the, that's the difference, I would say, between the two, uh, two, uh, pol uh, two uh, uh, leaders. For Vajpayee, you know, he went in a bus in 1999 to, um, to uh, Lahore and and uh, it was the most uh, moving thing because, you know, I was there covering that bus ride and it was uh, one, you know, it was this sort of the golden sunlight of the northern subcontinent at four in the afternoon. And you had Vajpayee stepping out of the bus and you had Nawaz Sharif standing on, you know, where they would welcome him in the 21 gun salute and kites flew into the air and, you know, the band sounded up and Vajpayee came out with his misty eyes saying, you know, it is with a sense of elation that I find myself back in Pakistan. And it was a time of heady emotion and, you know, peacemaking. And then on the same trip, Vajpayee went to the Minare Pakistan in, uh, in Lahore and he wrote, uh, you know, in that book that a stable, united and prosperous Pakistan is what India wants. 
And then at the governor's uh, reception later on uh, in the, on that trip, he was asked that, you know, you went to the Minare Pakistan and he said, ha, mere party wale to, uh, laga ki main Minare Pakistan gaya. Uh, and mere party mein kehte hai ki aap Pakistan ja ke unke upar, Pakistan mein mohar kyun laga diya? You know, why have you given your stamp of approval of Pakistan? So then he said, kya Pakistan ko mujhe meri mohar ki zarurat hai? Pakistan to apne dam se chalta hai, meri mohar ki zarurat nahi hai. So, you know, Vajpai, uh, <coughs> you know, was willing to go out the box of his own party and, uh, uh, and, um, and, uh, and reach out to Pakistan because politically, uh, you know, it made sense to him because politically he was about consensus and he was about solving India's problems through consensus. He deeply right. believed this and he kept saying it that, you know, you can't solve India's problems unless you have consensus and consensus meant that you had to reach out to different communities. Right. What we have at the moment, I think, is ideology, ideology, right. ideology, ideology. Uh, and uh, Mr. Modi is ideologically driven and an ideologue. You know, he's an RSS Pracharak. Vajpayee was never an RSS Pracharak. Vajpayee was in the RSS. He was not an ideologue. You know, the, he, he was not an ideologue. And, and I think what happened is, you see, in 2004, if Vajpayee had won that election, mm -hmm. then but the Vajpayee line would have been established as the line, uh, right. as, as, as the winning line. You know, uh, pluralism, economic liberalization, right wing politics within parliament, reaching out to neighbors, Mandir on the back burner. This would have been um, established as the winning line. But because he lost so badly and he himself was wiped out and the BJP was wiped out in 2004, at that point, the mm -hmm. sun said, well, all this Vajpayee, you know, pluralism, centrism, you know, uh, reaching out, consensus building, I mean, all this is not getting us anywhere. And now right. we need Vichardhara, Vichardhara, Vichardhara. So, you right. know, they were held for leather for Vichardhara. Mr. Modi was the Hindutva Ridaya Samrat. He was the ideologue and uh, the um, right-wing politics, I think in India, I think this is a quite a mm -hmm. tragedy actually, that right-wing politics was kind of taken out of parliament and onto the right. stage and into andolans, whereas Vajpayee mm -hmm. had located it within parliament, it was taken out now into the street and into andolans and there was massive Hindutva mobilization that was created by some Parivar outfits then across the board. Um, remember the Gujarat riots had been the uh, had been a sort of test case of uh, Hindutva, you know, in a sense of Hindutva mobilization. And Mr. Narendra Modi had won the 2002 election uh, on a strongly, uh, the 2002 Gujarat election on a strongly Hindutva platform. So Modi had won, Vajpayee lost. So Moditva defeated Vajpayeeism. So the rise right. of Moditva was uh, was as a result of the defeat of Vajpayeeism. If Vajpayeeism mm. had triumphed in 2004, mm. then Mudatwa would, would have been marginalized, but Vajpayee didn't, he lost. Right. Vajpayeeism died with Vajpayee. So that, that's what I have analyzed it as, the, the, the death and the destruction of Vajpayeeism sent the Sang Parivar and the BJP uh, towards Moditwa because it was uh, the the feeling was that this Vajpayee line is not getting us any votes. Right uh, now, you know this. We can now address the elephant in the room. Technically, that one of the major hallmarks of the shrinking democratic state in this country perhaps would be the perceptions around Indian secularism. Mm -hmm. Speaking of uh, secularism. Where did Vajpayee stand exactly? And I would give you a hypothetical scenario now that how do you think he would have responded to some of the current controversies, for example, particularly if I talk about a hijab banning controversy at this point, point in time, uh, how he would be placed? Uh, you know, Vajpayee was a, was a tremendous critic of Nehruvian secularism, and uh, he believed that Nehruvian secularism was deeply flawed. Uh, he believed that it unnecessarily privileged uh, the Muslim community, and that it did not, that it created um, injustices uh, in the way that the religious equilibrium in India was being maintained. He was tremendously anti-conversions. 
Uh, he was uh, certainly uh, in favor of uh, doing away with Article 370. Uh, Vajpayee's way of dealing with Article 370 for Kashmir would be, you know, he said at one point, Article 370, dhire dhire jayega. You know, that let it just go, let it just kiso. You know, I mean, uh, there was no need to bring in state power and dictate by the state, but it should just be allowed to uh, sort of my, you know, die through people to people contact. Uh, and I think that uh, on the hijab controversy, I think it's interesting because uh, I think Bajpai, for example, never had a problem with wearing a skull cap to iftar parties. Bulam Nabi Azad told me that uh, he would uh, he would wear a skull cap to his uh, iftar parties. He would come to his Diwali bashes. Today, BJP leaders would not see me dead wearing a skull cap. Bajpai used to wear it. Um, I think on hijab, Bajpai would probably, uh, you know, it's impossible to say because you know he lived in a very different time. Uh, but I think he would probably turn it over to the court. So he would probably, uh, I think he would probably be in favor of a uh, kind of a uniform civil code and, you know, a uniform uh, dress code for everybody. You know, uh, I think in that sense, um, he was against, you know, as he kept saying that you can't play politics from the mosque. If you uh, if you don't want politics from the mandir, then you can't play politics from the mosque. If you don't want politics from the mandir, you can't play politics from the church or the gurdwara. So uh, I think he was he was uh, he was opposed to uh, to uh, all forms of uh, uh, religious what he called all forms of religious politics. I mean, I wouldn't say that Bajpayee was majoritarian. Uh, but I think he would probably be on the side of, uh, um, you know, of, of, uh, of, you know, I don't think he would really be in favor of the hijab, I think. Right. I don't think so. I mean, it's difficult to say where he would stand, but uh, I think he would probably be on the side of, uh, of that if, the, if a school has a certain uniform or if a college has a certain uniform, then everybody has to wear that uniform. Uh, and everybody has to wear that particular dress. So I, I think the, the element, you know, I, I, which is why I say Vajpayee was not a liberal. You know, he's not a liberal in the way that I'm a liberal. Uh, I believe in um, equality of citizenship. I believe in freedom of choice. I believe in individual choice. I believe in individual dignity. And I believe that I cannot be constrained in any way by the category in which I'm born. Uh, you know, whether that's by the category of gender or category of class or category of caste or whatever, uh, I believe that the individual is supreme over the category in which uh, they are born. Uh, but I also realized that that is a privileged position. And But Bajpai did not uh, did not believe that. I think he did believe that uh, uh, the Nehruvian secularism and the secularism of the Congress party, uh, you know, was, was flawed. And it was, right. was, was, was needed, needed, needed to be changed. So I think on hijab, I don't think he would be in favor of hijab. No. So I think, uh, you know, going by what you were saying, uh, it would be the line of uniform civil code as has always uniform been. Civil uh, code, uh, yes. Uniform civil code for sure. Uniform civil code for sure. Strong hmm. line on conversion. Uh, he was anti-conversion. Uh, you know, uh, I think he would certainly in favor of doing away with Article 370. But his methods were different. You know, his right. methods were parliament, parliament. He was a right-wing politician. Let's not make any mistakes. Perhaps. I mean, he, Bajpai was not a fuzzy-wuzzy liberal. Um, right. You know, uh, he was a right-wing Hindu nationalist politician on the right of the, uh, of the uh, ideological divide. But he was located, what I, what I mean is that he was located in parliament and he was located right. in politics. You know, he would have been in the, in the, in the say, the Tory party or the Republican party or, yeah, you know, he would have been a, um, a you know, a, a right winger in parliament. So, which is why I, as a liberal, I had to struggle in a way to understand him. And why I, it, it was one of the reasons why I found the book challenging, a little more challenging to me than Indira Gandhi was because Indira Gandhi I could understand very well because she was, you know, she can I, her ideo ideological worldview was more familiar to me. Vajpayee's ideological worldview was not familiar to me, and I had to try and I had to struggle to understand it. And I, I, I did find that his ideological worldview was different from mine. But because he was located in parliament and because he was located in uh, democracy, uh, and because he always listened to the other side, I found that I could also 
listen to him and uh, agree to disagree in a way. Mm. You can agree to disagree with Bajpai, but he's but he makes possible um, the the uh, operation of right wing politics within uh, you know within parliament. That's his that's right. his contribution. Right. So uh, I think. Uh, you know what i can derive from you what you are saying right now is that uh, all these things that we have been seeing uh, say a ban on this and uh, uniform civil code etc perhaps uh, the end goal is the same but the method and the approach would have been yes different. and also also and the, Bajpai, Bajpai was not a totalitarian he would not i don't think he would ever push the state i mean he was all for withdrawing the state from exactly. the economy right so there will right. not be a state intrusion into what you wear, what you eat, what you drink, what you say, what you read, what you write. I mean, the kind of intrusion of the state that you have today, mm. policing personal choices. I think this would be unthinkable to watch. Right? Kind of, he, uh, he was a convinced non-vegetarian. He was a big drinker. Uh, so I think uh, to him, uh, to for, for, for the instruments of state to be used to um, to uh, uh, police personal choices, I think this would have been unthinkable for him. So he was not an right. authoritarian uh, uh, person at all. But as I say, he was a Democrat located on the right. Uh, now, this uh, takes me to my next question. How did he deal with the protests of that time? I mean, we see protests being dealt with at, that, at uh, this particular uh, time uh, with the current regime. It's been pretty harsh, and um, you know we see political prisoners also. Um, yeah. What was it? What was it uh, that was different in Vajpayee's life? Well, I don't think you had the kind of remember the Vajpayee regime actually came up with the with the CAA, you know, with the Citizenship Law, right. exactly, two thousand and three. Yeah. But the it, the the that law was against uh, illegal immigrants. Uh, not directed very clearly as it is uh, against Muslims. You know, right. uh, the, right. the law today says uh, refugees from uh, Hindu refugees from uh, from uh, neighboring countries are welcome. Hindus, Sikhs, Jains, Christians, right. except you know, doesn't except. mention Muslims. Right. But I mean, right. that this this was not there in the in the two thousand and three law. That was where. Uh, there, that law was about codifying and registering illegal immigrants, and, and governments down the down the decades have tried to, you know, have tried to find uh, ways of verifying citizenship because you know it, uh, illegal immigrant uh, migrants is a problem, uh, right. uh, particularly after the 1971 Bangladesh war, particularly because of porous borders, and so uh, there have been attempts made by both the NDA and the UPA to. Uh, uh, to uh, uh, you know, to to, to verify uh, citizens, and to verify and to, and to you know to, to enumerate illegal immigrants and you know to look at migration flows, but it was not as directed towards Muslims uh, as exactly. as it is today. Today it seems to be mm -hmm. directed particularly to one community. That was not the case, so you didn't have that kind of mega um, protest uh, against this law. Uh, and you didn't have the kind of student. You didn't have the kind of student protests in uh, in in Vajpayee's time that you have today. You simply didn't have them. I mean, I was a journalist in Vajpayee's time, and day and night we were attacking Vajpayee night and day. In in, uh, in you know, I was in the Indian Express at the time, and there was no uh, feeling that oh gosh, I'll be you know put on a sedition or I'll be taken off to jail or I'll be you know uh, sort of uh, put on a various UAPA or all of that. But yes, I mean. Uh, for example, when the Tehelka sting operation was uh, screened in 2001, Bajpayee's government came down very hard on Tehelka. The offices were raided. Outlook right. magazine did an expose on the Bajpayee's PMO. Uh, Outlook was raided and uh, Rajan Rehikla's offices were raided. Rajan Rehikla was the proprietor of Outlook. But you didn't have the kind of, uh, you know, all out uh, sort of uh, state oppression of citizens, frankly, as you have today. That just wasn't the case. Also, an atmosphere uh, he, of fear. The atmosphere of fear, or the atmosphere of you know, of 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 uh, 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 dictatorial state power being used against citizens, right. uh, was simply not there. You didn't have the sedition law being hurled at you know from everyone, from you know Minal Pandey to uh, Nantara Sehgal. I mean, this would have been unthinkable for Vajpayee. It would have been unthinkable. Right. I mean, he actually had. Um, 
uh, a sort of a, a panchvati hall where he created you know which was a hall which he created within the parliamentary complex where he actually uh, had uh, you know writers and poets to come and talk and his daughter namita namita bhattacharya uh, herself actually took part in a uh, took part in a uh, meeting you know against the ram mandir so right. uh, ajpai himself had many left friends i mean he used to walk home with geeta mukherjee and hanan mulla and you know he just he had he had friends across the board with leftist uh, uh, politicians so i think uh, i think that the kind of state terror that we have today and the fear and trembling that we have today the atmosphere of um, of uh, utter fear that many of us exist exist in today that was not there at all i mean it was not there in ajpai's time at all uh, i would say that there was uh, there were attempts to browbeat the media uh, you know as in the helka and in the outlook uh, case but certainly nothing like this so, and how he dealt with protest was bachpai the protest against bachpai actually came from his own brotherhood came from um, the vishwa hindu parishad the swadeshi jagran manch and from the mm-hmm. bharatiya mazdoor sangh and he reached out to the rss in many ways uh to try and mollify them and bring them over to his side uh, but they were the they were the real malcontents in vajpai's time i yeah. would say so the kind of student protest or farmers protest or you know uh, the kind of uh, uh, sort of roiling uh, sort of uh, citizens protest citizens anger that we have today uh, was not there in vajpai's time i think it would have been unthinkable for him to uh, you know to imprison students under sedition Uh, or you know, slap sedition on cartoonists and all of that. Uh, sounds like a dream, but just no, to move no, on. No, 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 it wasn't a dream. It wasn't an idyll. But uh, you know, in the sense that, uh, in the sense that, I think you know the reason why uh, Vajpay is valuable is because of the fact that you know Hindu nationalist politics or right wing politics in India. can exist within parliament and you know every country every democracy has the two party system right you have Absolutely. the republicans and the democrats you have the tories and the labor and uh, i for example agree with the uh, historian alex von tunzelman who's actually uh, said in her book that you know the congress should actually have disbanded in 1947 uh, as mahatma gandhi wanted it to do and should have had two wings you know the leftist wing under jawala nehru and the rightist wing under sardar patel and that and india that would have had a two party system and they could have called themselves different names you know one could have been some some other party and one could have been some other party but you know when you have the congress being a juggernaut and monopolizing the political space the way it did the uh the opposition to the congress naturally came from the extremes and i think this was this was a, this was a sort of a uh dysfunction in the indian political uh system i think congress should have disbanded in 1947 it should have allowed a left wing party and a right wing party to uh, big, uh, to form as its two heirs and should have battled it out as an ideological battle and bajpai came closest to creating that democratic moment when you had a sort of left of center congress and a right of center bjp battling it out in parliament so i think that was bajpai's um uh, sort of uh, contribution and his moment and i think right. that had he won in 2004 uh, that could have uh, you know the process could have uh, uh, could have continued and the right fight could have been embedded in the right, right wing of indian politics uh you know when i just you uttered that it seems like a dream uh, it's it's not probably uh, in an absolute sense but i uh, definitely am referring to this in a uh, relative term so nowadays yeah. you see you see bajpai being talked about as a moderate leader time and again uh, you already mentioned that you don't think that he's a liberal and which we all should be agree he was a liberal in government not in, a liberal right. in, in conviction i think So would you agree with that? That um, you know the situation, the current regime makes it appear so, makes it makes him appear moderate, perhaps. You could uh, you could argue that, but but I would say that uh, you know if you look at it, uh, I think that if you look at Bajpai's achievements, for example, uh, it's best to be a factarian in these issues. You know, uh, 
And the facts are that he uh, rolled government power back. He rolled back the power of the government from the economy. Uh, you know, he did make attempts to um, reach consensus on Ram Mandir. Uh, he did not allow the car saver in uh, March 2002 to, you know, embark on another campaign in, uh, in Ayodhya. Uh, and he sent, uh, you know, uh, none other than L.K. Advani into dialogue with the Hurriyat. I mean, think about it. I mean, the Hurriyat is the separatist, Kashmiri, nationalist party opposed, deadly opposed to New Delhi. And uh, Shakti Sinha describes it very well that, you know, uh, in 2004, when the issue came up about dialogue in Kashmir, and remember, Vajpai had gone to Srinagar and chased Urdu, had, had delivered a speech saying Kashmir must be solved on the basis of uh, Insaniyat, Jamhuriyat, uh, Kashmiriyat. Insaniyat, Jamhuriyat, Kashmiriyat. These were the three words he used. And uh, so, and, and, and then he, wa he then wanted to engage in a dialogue with the Hurriyat conference, which is the separatist, radical, you know, called radical Islamist, whatever conference of Kashmir. And uh, uh, Shakti Sinha describes the situation of how uh, Vajpayee decided to go into dialogue with the Hurriyat and he was looking at all his cabinet ministers, you know, Arun Shori, Yashwan Sinha, Jaswan Singh, Yarke Pani, and the issue came up ki Hurriyat ke saath kaun baat karega? And uh, he turned to Advani and said, aap baat karega. You know, so the, the, the most hardline Hindutva hawk was sent into dialogue with the Hurriyat. Uh, mm. So, in, in that sense, I think Vajpayee did that, right? He went to Kashmir and spoke about Kashmir, the Insaniyat and Jamhuriyat. He went to Pakistan in a bus. He sent uh, uh, L.K. Advani uh, into a dialogue with, uh, with the Hurriyat. He, um, you know, he, uh, he went on a fast after Graham Stain's, uh, the Graham Stain's uh, murder. So, he, on the one hand, he was, he also, uh, you know, he also failed the test of constitutional democracy many times. Uh, Vajpayee made a speech in 1970 where he said, Ab Hindu mar nahi In 1992, he went to Ayodhya before the demolition of the Babri Masjid, said, Ab Bedi to banegi, you know, that famous speech where the ground had to be leveled. Yeah. He went to Nelly and made a blood curdling speech. Uh, but he, uh, but at the same time that he did that, in government, he tried to make peace with Pakistan, reach out to Muslims, reach out to Kashmir, reach out to uh, reach out to the Hurriyat, and all of that. So he was one thing in the opposition and one thing in government. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think in government, uh, he does seem like a moderate. Uh, he 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 does seem like a moderate because I think he was a moderate. But in in life, or in in his own as an opposition leader, he certainly wasn't a moderate. I think where we can fail where we can where we can blame Vajpayee is that he failed to um, realize that the power of religious nationalism could overwhelm democracy uh, in the way that it's yeah. going today. So I think that you know Chandra Shekhar had told him that uh, you know you're riding this tiger but you won't be able to dismount. I think Vajpayee thought he could dismount. He thought that India mm. was strong and the structures were strong and the institutions were strong and it, whatever happened, you know, the structures would continue. I think he fatally underestimated that the Hindutva tiger that he was riding and which he mm -hmm. rode to power, which he cynically used to come to power, um, could overwhelm the same democracy in parliament which he held to be so precious. Uh, right. It, it is uh, something that, that really rattles us that how um, this whole, uh, you know, contradiction ultimately you know paid back in a way that it's it's very difficult for us to you know democratically stand again on our feet um, yes i think democratically uh, the, the, the religious majoritarianism is overwhelming our democracy uh, and over and creating an electoral autocracy and you know, electoral autocracy is married to majoritarian religiosity, which is what it make, makes it even more frightening. Uh, <clears throat> you know, so uh, in that sense, uh, I think uh, Vajpayee perhaps uh, underestimated uh, underestimated the force of this ideology. 
Of course, of course, I am sure that, uh, you know, as you were mentioning, it was quite under the illusion of a very different India, which it was, yes. which India is still not prepared with. Yeah. Uh, uh, now we have, uh, you know, a few questions from the attendees. Okay. So first, I'll take uh, those questions and if I have time, then I'll prompt you to one last question. Uh, but first, okay. I'll ask uh, Jyoti Moy to unmute himself. And, Where are uh, the other uh, questions on a chat box or in a... In a uh, Jyoti Moy and uh, Shoham will be asking questions and they'll okay. be directly asking you questions. Okay, okay, Jyoti Moy. Okay. They'll be asking questions. Uh, Jyoti Ma'am, yeah. ma as we can see in the cabinet, I think Ma'am Vajpayee Ji had very good and very liberal minister. Ma'am, if we look at the law, law officers team he has, I mean, he has Mr. D.Y. Chandrachur, who is now ST judge, Mr. Salve, Mr. Soli Sorabji, who was known for the human rights and very, he was very liberal in fact. Mm -hmm. Then why I think Vajpayee Ji's government is still labeled as he was very anti-liberal and anti-something. Ma'am, in case of Mr. Modi, we can understand the, you know, the use of sedition law, the misuse of UAP and all these things. But ma'am, why with Vajpayee Ji? Thank you. No, I don't think he was anti-liberal. I think Bajpai was, uh, I, no, no, in fact, I have written liberal statesman. <laughs> liberal statesman, that's how I yes, describe it. Yes, ma'am, you have mentioned that, but ma'am, people generally consider him as anti-liberal. That was my question, I think. Just because well, he, he belonged to Shasta or he had, ma'am, Mr. Alke Advani as home minister, ma'am, mm -hmm. I don't know, probably. Well, I think Bajpai uh, is considered anti-liberal because uh, I, I don't think he's considered anti-liberal, is he? I, I mean, I don't know. I think Bajpai was not, he was not a, you know, he was not a, uh, a liberal, I would not describe Bajpai as a classical liberal in his thinking. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the sense that he was a liberal statesman, he was a liberal prime minister because in government, he was not an RSS fan. Bajpai was a uh, RSS fan, say, with all his life. He never broke with the RSS. Um, he uh, regularly made, uh, uh, you know, Hindu nationalist speeches. Uh, he uh, he uh, campaigned on uh, you know Hindu consolidation. His first uh, election in 1957 in Balrampur, uh, he uh, campaigned on a on on the on, on, a, on the issue that uh, the Hindu community in Balrampur was. Uh, denied certain rights because of the Muslim landlords. Um, Bajpai was, uh, was a believer in, uh, he, he was very anti-conversions. You know, he was not a, uh, he was not a sort of, a, I would say, a believer in, uh, you know, I, I, I don't call him a classical liberal because I think he was a Hindu nationalist. Uh, that was his belief system. But his government was certainly not anti-liberal, not at all. It was very liberal. I mean, economically, it was very, very liberal. Um, but uh, I think the reason why Bajpai is not considered a liberal is because, again, I say that he was a member of the RSS. He was a member of the uh, of uh, some parivar all his life. He never broke with it. Uh, if I may just, uh, you know, come in in this and, you know, uh, I think one of the liberal traits that Bajpai probably had is uh, the very fact that he... Uh, Letting the opposition to thrive or letting yeah, the opposition definitely. to talk, which, yeah, yeah, yeah. which I think we have a very difficult yeah, yeah, yeah. place right now, also because of the weakening of the opposition. Yes, but you know, uh, frankly, Nehruvian parliamentary democracy made possible the emergence of Nehru, Nehru's greatest opponents. I mean, if, ne if there had not been any parliament, we would not have heard Mr. Bajpai. <laughs> you know, in a parliamentary right. democracy, uh, the opposition has no executive role. The opposition's home is parliament. Uh, right. Parliament is where the opposition questions the government. Today, if you shut down parliament, if you don't allow the opposition to speak, uh, where is the uh, opposition going to be able to question the government? Bajpai was given the space to speak. Bajpai made all those garma garam bhashans and he was on, you know, the roaring, stormy petrol of parliament. Because Parliament was the center of India's life at the moment, at, at that time, you know. Today, there is a disjunction between Parliament and electability. You know, today, you can be a stellar parliamentarian. And Mahua Maitra, for example, I think is a terrific mm. parliamentarian. She makes terrific speeches and she's a very good parliamentarian. But and Mahua, a very good 
and a very good orator. But Mahua Majra to win her seat needs the personality culture of Mamta Banerjee. She can't win her seat uh, without Mamta Banerjee, who is never in right. parliament. So um, today you have the cult of personality, you have the media, the mass media, you have Twitter, Facebook. So the media has created personality cults and supremo cults. And also there's a supremo cult, cults happening in politics who are winning elections. You know, I mean, right. um, all these MPs who have won uh, for the BJP or the 300 plus MPs. I mean, do you hear them speak in parliament? Nobody, we don't know how they speak. We don't know how they perform. Absolutely. Uh, but they all win. And they all win because yeah. of Mr. Modi and the cult of personality of Mr. Modi. Now, in Vajpayee's time, in the 50s and 60s, you won because you performed in parliament. Uh, you know, whether it was a Nathpai or a Vinu Masani or a, uh, you know, Hirendra Nath Mukherjee or a Bhupesh Gupta, there were these terrific parliamentarians. And, you know, this was one of the treats for me when I was researching this book, because I got to read the parliamentary debates of the 1950s and 60s. And if you have time, I would recommend that you read these debates. I mean, they are amazing. They're funny, they're witty, they're full of jokes, and, and they are, of course, very knowledgeable and very erudite. And these men were winning... Uh, elections because of the way they performed in parliament mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. today you can be a super performer in parliament but uh, you may not win nobody even will know and you will not win your seat you will win your Absolutely. seat the so there's a disjunction between electability and parliamentary performance today uh, at that time it was not the case and uh, Bajpai himself was a member of parliament a uh, member of the opposition all his life. So I think it would be unthinkable for Vajpayee to call the opposition uh, Tukre Tukre gang or Khan Market gang or try to shut up parliament, I, I think, mm. or shut down parliament. This Absolutely. would have been unthinkable for Vajpayee. So I think Absolutely. I, yeah. uh, clearly. Now, uh, I would uh, ask Shoham to pose his question and then we'll move ahead. Shoham? Good evening, ma'am. Uh, I had a question uh, saying that uh, the scholarly articles you find that the populism always based its root in the ideological nerve of the people. Now, uh, as an expert, I would just like your opinion that do you think that the nature of populism has changed in India from the time of Rajpanji to the present that the core voters. Populism. Populism, yes, ma'am. Yeah. That the core voters of the winning coalition are more disjunct to the liberalist liberal parties and, and corruption in the present, leading them to oppose the politics of recognition and statism by the liberal centrist parties. Leading them to oppose uh, the politics of recognition and statism. Yes. Well, you see, this is absolutely, I mean, I think this is the age of the uh, autocratic populist, right? Uh, whether it is the, the Erdogan in Turkey, whether it is uh, Viktor Orban in Poland, whether it is uh, uh, Donald Trump in the United States, who may well come back uh, in Venezuela, in, uh, you know, countries across the world, Mr. Putin. Uh, these are all the elected autocrats and the elected populists who, uh, who basically come to power through democracy and then turn their backs on democracy uh, and uh, the institutions of democracy. You know, Bajpayee had a great line, Mariada um, mein rehkar simao ke bhitar, meaning that, you know, stay within the limits of democracy. You see, democracy is not just about elections. Democracy is about parliament, it's about rules, it's about norms, it's about judiciary, it's about cabinet, it's about media, it's about respecting the rules of democracy. But populists don't respect the rules of democracy. They are simply, you know, uh, sort of uh, trying to whip up their voters through direct messaging and direct populist messaging and creating a kind of media uh, media driven cult by which they um, by which they 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 actually turn their backs on democracy so you know it was said that in the 1930s the enemy of democracy was communism in the 1940s the enemy of democracy was fascism today the enemy of democracy is democracy because through the uh, through the through it is through the democratic system that these leaders, that these populists are emerging and the populists are emerging and that the rise of populism is a, you know, that's a whole different subject. I mean, we could go on for another hour on that. Uh, I mean, that is, I believe, a result of a very carefully 
uh, whipped up sort of a sentiment which combines cultural war, class war, uh, combines a certain fury against uh, elites. It is in many ways a uh, side effect of globalization because globalization creates winners and losers it creates those who are uh, winning the globalization game those who lose out of the globalization game and uh, when you when you have a large bank of people who are losers in the globalization game who blame their uh, uh, you know their misfortune on scapegoats on elites on immigrants on um, you know, religious minorities, you're looking for blame figures, you're looking for enemy figures, you're looking for other, the enemy, uh, you're othering your political opponent, and you're looking to pin the blame for your own misfortune, uh, or for your own, uh, uh, you know, for your own uh, so status uh, on, on scapegoats, and the populace will harness that towards their own cause and use it to uh, whip up sentiment. In the, in the, in the West, you have that, that the migrant becoming the enemy. Uh, in India, you have the religious minorities who are scapegoated as the enemy. Uh, and, and the enemies keep changing. I mean, you know, I, I, but I've written about at length about this in my other book, Why I'm a Liberal. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, you, you have the notion of perpetually looking for an enemy. You need enemies all the time. So where, where the, if, you know, once you first you had the anti-national, then you had the urban naxal, then you had the Han market gang, then you have the Tukre Tukre gang. So you always need these enemies against whom you are mobilizing um, your support base. And this is what populists are very good at. So uh, I think in some senses there is a, uh, there is a sort of a, uh, atmosphere being created for populism by the mass media, by social media. Social media is creating algorithm driven silos in which we are getting trapped, which is creating uh, the, um, the, 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 the sort of climate for identity politics, the climate for uh, being our worst selves, right? How does social media work? Social media works through an algorithm which is always trying to grab your attention. It needs your attention, it's the attention economy. And the attention economy is based on harnessing your worst self. You like to see rage, anger, hatred, enmity. Uh, you like watching car wrecks and train wrecks. So you're being hooked onto uh, social media and social media is imprisoning you in your silo. You know, when you switch on your Facebook or you switch on your Twitter, you see something very different from what I see. So you are, uh, have you seen a movie called the a documentary called The Social Dilemma. You should watch that. You must watch that. You know, we must all watch this movie, this documentary called The Social Dilemma, because it really shows how the algorithm driven social media is creating uh, a fertile ground for the rise of populism. So, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, in that sense, I think that uh, we're in for very scary times. Uh, of course, uh, you know, populism, I think, needs, uh, populism needs a whole different discussion, discussion, discussion on its together. own. Okay. Yeah, different, uh, different discussion altogether. But absolutely. You know, the, first, the original populist in India, I would say, was Indira Gandhi. You know, she was the original definitely. populist and, you know, electoral autocrat. And uh, when she rose, a whole lot of parties were just destroyed by her populist revolution, like the Swatantra Party. Uh, and of course, the then Vajpayee-led Jansang. We can definitely, uh, you know, ask argumentative Indians to make another session for us. Yes, but yes. Uh, just as a, a you know closing um, question, ma I would ma'am, just one you. question. I would like uh, to. Uh, Is there another question? Jyoti, ma'am, can I can I just go ahead and uh, okay, then give you the space? Thank you. Uh, so uh, you know what I just wanted to. You were talking about social media, but uh, since you have been a journalist for the longest time, three decades. I would like to ask you about media particularly and how the role of media has evolved. Now, I'm not just saying we have already established that media, uh, you know, projects and portraits, but as we are aware that today we are seeing the controlling of media narratives and it has almost become a norm to the extent that we see in the contemporary times, leaders are only going for favorable media to speak with. So it is easy to evade all the complicated and difficult questions, right? So 
what is uh, its bearing on indian democracy and how does it reflect differently on vajpayee and you you know interviewed i think uh, loads of leaders uh, i'm sure that time and now how do you see this this change happen you know uh, devangana uh, it's very very uh, this is a good question i think you know in india our democratic institutions are very fragile so when there is a very powerful executive any powerful executive when the political party in power rules with a 300 plus majority the institutions crumble whether it's the judiciary whether it's the media whether it's the cabinet system whether it's the parliament whether it's the universities whether it's the cultural bodies nobody can stand up to a super powerful executive because you know when you have a leader who's got 300 seats uh, in 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 the parliament he or she just dominates our entire political life so no institution can stand up to this and the media has completely buckled i mean if the media uh, crawl during the emergency as lk advani once said you were asked to bend and you crawl today the media is doing a shashtang pranam uh, to uh, the political leadership now why is this the case you see in 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 media as i said first of all nobody can stand up to a to a powerful executive if the, if the mighty judiciary and if the mighty cabinet system if the mighty opposition is uh, is being reduced to uh, is being reduced you know to 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 nothingness then what about the media you see the media is now there are, there are almost 400 licensed tv channels today right and the uh, the tv channels the private tv channels are uh, financed by advertising they're financed by the advertiser now they're all competing for the same advertising pie and so you need the politician to come to your show you need the politician to come to give interviews you need the politician to come for a award function you need to come politician to come and uh, you need to cover the politician you need to cover give the politician politicians to come on your program politicians to come on your uh, on your symposium on your conclave you are a complete parasite on the political class because you need the politician to come to your show because the more politicians you have the more the advertiser will support you because the advertiser thinks that you are um the happening channel who gets all the powerful politicians so if you are able to get the home minister and the prime minister and the and the defense minister and the finance minister all on your channel you will get lots of advertising and you will get lots of money now the fact is the politician is the top dog he's the king of the ring he can go to any any channel that he wants and if he doesn't want if i like a particular channel he will not go to that particular channel that channel will die because no advertiser will come and say yeah so koi nahi jata yahan let's let's forget it so the whole system is rigged in a way that is favoring the politician so the politician has the right to uh, has the power to decide who he will give access to whose interviews he will go to whose show he will go to whose channel he will appear on and if you oppose a politician he will simply not go to your show it's not like it's not like the bbc where you know the where politicians go to a, the, the 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 bbc because they feel they need to answer the questions of the public mr modi has been in power for 8 years he's not had a single press conference not a single open press conference he only gives interviews to uh, journalists who are extremely friendly with him and who ask only questions about how many mangoes he eats or how many you know how many changes of clothes he makes and all of that but and why is that and but the public doesn't seem to mind mm-hmm. it's not as if he's uh, he's uh, losing any elections because of that so uh, the 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 journalistic community if it wants to you know if the proprietors want want to survive if the proprietors want to have uh, functioning media houses it makes sense for them to stay on the right side of the of the of the government because that's where the advertising is that's where the power uh, equations are that's where the access is that's where uh, you know that's where the relevance is tomorrow if you question the government the politician will simply shut you out you will not be able to do any journalism you will not get any interviews you will not come on your show you will not you will not have any conclaves you will not have any symposiums and you will not be able to uh, to function but we have seen bajpayee ji i was an anchor on cnn and ibn i don't know if any any of you remember that you know we had a channel called cnn and ibn i was an anchor 
and uh, Mr. Ambani was a was a investor in CNN and IBN. He was very fine with all of us. We were doing our thing. We were questioning the government. We were doing everything. Twenty fourteen, everything changed. It suddenly became that you know uh, only a certain line of questioning was encouraged, and a lot of us had to leave. Or not had to leave, but but resigned. So uh, a number of people have resigned from mainstream media houses. And I think it's because uh, of an intolerance on the part of the proprietors. Have you seen a film called The Post? Have you seen a film called The Post where Catherine Graham takes on Nixon? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you, so, 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 you know, the proprietor has to back you, right? Right, you absolutely. The owner or the owner of the uh, TV channel or the owner of the, uh, of the media outlet has to back the journalist. Who is the journalist? The journalist is the employee. The journalist has to ask the questions. But if the owner tells you, you can't ask questions. If you ask questions, I'm going to sack you. But you have to resign. Then you either have to resign or you have to draw the line. So, so to uh, you know, briefly say that uh, the ecosystem has changed from Vajpayee Ji's time because we have seen Vajpayee Ji actually facing challenging questions from the media as well. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, Vajpayee used to face a lot of question, challenges from uh, from uh, from uh, journalists all the time. All the would time. Would you was, would you assign that only to the changing ecosystem in media, or the personality as well? I mean, it, the, the the entire uh, the entire system has changed. You know, uh, because right. today, as I said, said you have a uh, extremely powerful government with a massive majority uh, which is riding roughshod over all, all democratic norms i don't think Absolutely. you had the judiciary as cowed down as it uh, was in uh, uh, judiciary was not cowed down in Vajpayee's time uh, the yeah. uh, universities were not cowed down in Vajpayee's time the cultural bodies were not cowed down in Vajpayee's time the media was not cowed down in Vajpayee's time uh, so, uh, you know, so Bajpai used to take a lot of, in fact, you know, when he was foreign minister, he was asked once, you know, he was going on about Tibet and, uh, you know, and, and China and, you know, uh, United States. And one journalist stood up and said, Bajpai ji chori hai Tibet or, uh, you know, United States or China. Mrs. Call ke baare mein bata hai. Mrs. Call kaun hai? And so Bajpai said, ye Kashmir jaisa maamla hai. You know, so that's the kind of easy questioning that he used to, he used to mm. even answer questions of his personal life. Right. So, um, so I think that uh, I think that uh, the entire system today is uh, is different. You know, it's an unrecognizable right. system. Absolutely. I don't think any of the Vajpayee ministers can recognize them. I mean, Mr. Yashwan Sinha today is in the Trinamool Congress. Mr. Arun Shuri is a huge critic of the Modi regime. Um, Mr. Vijay Goel, who's a great associate of uh, Mr. Bajpai, nobody knows where he is. Mr. L.K. Advani is the Mark Darshak. Completely yeah. He's, uh, he's marginalized. Uh, Mr. Jaswan Singh, of course, is sadly no more. Uh, many of the Bajpai ministers, the big Bajpai ministers, are nowhere in the picture today. Absolutely. I mean, uh, we can really go on on this, yeah, but I mean, you know, I we think, are. You know, I think uh, that Modi is much more of an Indira Gandhi kind of a leader with his own ideology than he is a Vajpayee leader. I think Vajpayee uh, was more of a democrat uh, than, uh, than with an ideology. Hmm. He was a democrat with an ideology, but he was more okay. of a democrat than, uh, you know, he was not a supremo personality cult. Riding roughshod over judiciary, roughshod over media, roughshod over uh, over democratic institutions, the way um, Indira Gandhi did, and the way Modi is doing, you know? right? Uh, in uh, that sense. Yes, I I would uh, you know Jyoti Mai had a question, so Jyoti Mai, please keep your uh, question very brief, and I would request um, Sabrika, please keep it very brief because we are yes. running um, we're way out of time, running, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I've been for two hours now. <laughs> almost, almost. Yes. Uh, Jyoti Mai, can you hear me? Ma'am, you have mentioned that Mr. Vajpayee was a very liberal statesman. Ma'am, rightly so. It was, ma'am. I think I have gone through your book, Why I Am a Liberal, and ma'am, he almost passed every test. Ma'am, I have partially read the book, but ma'am, I, I think that's my judgment on it. But ma'am, <laughs> if we look at the love jihad law and things like ma'am, keeping aside the legalities and all these things, ma'am, the hooliganistic attitude of the, you know, Hindutva men, men, what, how do you think Mr. Vajpayee would have reacted on this? Oh gosh, I think he would have been horrified by all of this. 
I I think I don't think Bajpayee would have uh, condoned all this hooliganism and uh, uh, you know uh, you know uh, there's a very interesting interview uh, which you should see on YouTube which Bajpayee gave uh, after the Babri Masjid was demolished where he actually yes, ma'am. I think to NDTV, right? Yes, to NDTV, where he apologized. He said we are very sorry. We're very sorry that this happened. A section of uh, car sevaks went out of control, and they did something that was not to be done. They should not have done this. And uh, I think he was, you know, if there was already a pre-existing plan to demolish the Babri Masjid, he certainly didn't know about it. And um, you know, I don't think Bajpai was uh, was uh, was would have uh, condoned uh, any form of hooliganism and love jihad and all of that. I mean, Bajpai has made speech after speech. Say, you know, Bajpai made a speech on. Uh, on dowry, uh, where he spoke about the evil of dowry, and he said that the only way we can um, we can uh, you know we can take away the evil of dowry is if girls and boys are allowed to freely marry and fall in love. Uh, so uh, you know, in that sense, I think he would be a uh, uh, you know falling in love and marrying and you know in, 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 intruding into personal freedoms, I think all of this would have been anathema to uh, Mr. Bajpai. I don't think he would have, I mean, he was himself, uh, you know, uh, uh, living a very unconventional life. So um, I don't think the the hooliganism and the, uh, the, the thuggishness and the uh, vigilantism would have been acceptable to him at all. Uh, you know, he, um, uh, uh, he was, uh, I, you know, uh, I think this is all, you know, as I said, this is all uber Hindutva ideology because of the fact that the government at the moment is really not a BJP mm -hmm. government. To me, it is a more of an RSS government. Uh, it, it's not a it's not a really a, a political government. It's a, it's a ideologically driven uh, cultural uh, sort of a uh, entity which is engaging in a cultural war. I don't think this was uh, this was much by at all, not at all. I think you would have been very disapproving of hooliganism. Of course, what we gather from this talk is uh, definitely that he would have been uh, not supportive of the militant way of no, not at politics, all, but not at all, but uh, politics that is rooted in parliament and um, has uh, you know a people centric approach uh, towards the government. Um, I'm, I'm immensely thankful to you for coming to this discussion with me. It was really a learning experience for me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, the conversation. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it greatly. Those were excellent questions and particularly very good questions from you, uh, Devangana. And, uh, you know, I think you, you really steered the discussion wonderfully. And I'm so glad that young people like you are thinking about uh, democratic freedoms and individual rights and freedom. Uh, freedoms uh, that are available to us. I, please, if you have the inclination, if you want to read my book, uh, Why I'm a Liberal, um, please do read it because I do think that all of us need to really be vigilant, at least about our personal freedoms. You know, the personal freedoms to write, read, eat, fall in love, marry. We cannot have the state taking over these, these freedoms and uh, state tyranny on personal freedom, uh, I think is something we have to be vigilant about and fight for, uh, you know, whether it's wearing any kind of dress we want or whatever, you know, leading the kind of life we want. Um, I think a healthy dose of uh, liberty uh, is really what we need. And uh, Bajpai was certainly about liberty and liberal values in government. So I'm very glad that we got the opportunity to talk. Your questions were wonderful. And so were the questions by, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in fact, by Soham and uh, by Jyotirmai. Uh, Thank man. you. Yeah. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Thank for, you so much uh, for having me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I would now be concluding the meeting. Um, we'll meet you next time very soon with probably uh, another session uh, with Argumentative India. I look forward to it. Thank you so Same. much.